Good evening. My name is Ken Hui. I'm a CHF board member. Welcome to the 24th of 31 presentations of AAPI Talks celebrating the AAPI Heritage Month. This event is sponsored by the Chinese American Heritage Foundation. The Chinese American Heritage Foundation is dedicated to celebrating the rich history of Chinese Americans' contributions to the American spirit. For information on how you can participate, please visit our website, cahf.us. During this presentation, please use Zoom's Q&A function to ask your questions, and we will read them during the Q&A period. This Zoom event is being recorded. Tonight, we have a very informative panel who will discuss OCA's legacy. Our panel moderator is Tu Win, Deputy Executive Director of OCA National. Welcome to, would you please introduce our panel? Thank you, Ken, um, and good evening, everybody. First, I'd like to again thank CACA Boston and the Chinese American Heritage Foundation for hosting this space for us to share about our legacy. Oftentimes we're so focused on our work now that we forget um, our legacy. And so when CACA approached us to share a little bit about OCA, I figured it would be really uplifting during these stressful times to hear just all about um, our accomplishments and get a short refresher on the history of API community building through OCA. And so I'm honored to have three of OCA leaders be here to share our story with you all. Uh, first, we have with us Christine Chen, who is the co-founder and executive director of Asian Pacific Islander American Vote, or API Vote, one of the most trusted national nonpartisan organizations. API Vote's mission is to work with local and state community-based orgs to mobilize Asian Americans and Pacific Islander communities in the um, in electoral and civic engagement. She served as executive director of OCA National from 2001 to 2006, um, where she was also a member of the executive committee of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, she was also a founding member of API Scholars and served on numerous boards, uh, including NCAPA, the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, uh, and Demo Board of Trustees. So she's currently uh, serves on the board of the, Nat the Kennedy Center and the Center for Asian American Media. Next, we have Deborah E. Chen or Debbie Chen, no relation. Uh, she's an immigration attorney at the law offices of Deborah e. Chen, Y. Chen um, and Associates and is a longtime community activist for the past 20 years. She's an expert in small minority women disadvantaged business enterprise, government contracting programs, and supplier diversity. Um, she serves on the board of OCA Greater Houston chapter. Um, where she co-founded the Houston API Film Festival Committee and co-organizes OCA Greater Houston's advocacy, um, such as monthly citizenship workshops, um, pro bono legal resources guides, and um, biannual exit surveys in Houston and other GOTV efforts. And last but not least, we have Roland Huang, who currently serves as the Vice President of Public Affairs for OCA National. He was the chapter president of OCA Detroit for three years, He's an attorney in immigration law and currently teaches Asian American history in the APIA studies program at the University of Michigan. He served for 27 years as an assistant attorney general for the state of Michigan. He also serves on the Michigan, Michigan Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and he's a former hearing referee for the Michigan, Michigan Department of Civil Rights. And so if I can have our panelists join us um, on stage. And just a refresher, if you're not familiar with OCA, we are a national membership-based civil rights nonprofit organization. We have over 50 chapters and affiliates across the country, where we, um, but we have a national headquarters in Washington, DC, where our staff runs programs, conducts policy and advocacy work, and supports our chapters nationwide. We're also supported by a business advisory council and an executive council that is elected from our national board of chapter presidents. Um, so I'll hand it over to Christine to get us started. Thank you too. Um, it's wonderful to be here and to really reflect back on the history of OCA. Uh, when I was even just going through my documents just to refresh my memory, it, you know, I began to really realize that the issues that we're dealing with today, it actually stems from decades long ago, 
centuries long ago. And so a lot of the work that OSE started back in 1973, it has really continued on and un unfortunately the issues still remain the same. So OSE back then was started by Alex Mark and Kale Wang, um, who were two Chinese American individuals who realized that as Chinese Americans, that they really need to um, start focusing on domestic issues. And that as immigrants, it couldn't just be focusing on what was happening abroad, but because their ne next generation of children were living here in the US and experiencing the world um, differently, that they really need to go ahead and create an organization that would deal with that. So what happened was that they went to um, the Chinese Association in St. Louis, in Michigan, and um, Maryland, Washington, D.C. area, and discussed it with the Chinese American leaders. And that was really the start of OCA. And at that point, it was called the Organization of Chinese Americans. Um, it was also decided that at that particular point that it will be a civil rights organization modeled after the Japanese American Citizens League, which is also a membership-based organization. And they also looked at the models of the NAACP as well. So we, um, OCA really has been a byproduct of organizations, civil rights organizations that were established before um, they did in 1973. So the very first issue that they really had tackled was um, the whole idea that this um, high school had a basketball team called the Peking Chinks. And so they launched a campaign to um, convert them into the Pekin Dragons. Um, so a lot of the early work that was done is really about um, you know, making sure that derogatory terms um, and portrayals of the Chinese community would be reversed and that we will tackle this uh, heads on. And you know, um, because OCA was one of the first, along with JCL, um, to have staff in Washington, D.C., then they also started to ensure that they have representation and joined in the broader civil rights um, coalitions and the work in working with the different administrations and members of Congress in dealing with a number of um, civil rights issues. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our friends over in um, Michigan with Roland, um, who will go ahead and talk about their work, um, especially in the beginning of time and what happened um, during the last 10 years after that, after we got started. Thank you, Christine. Uh, I guess the history and legacy of OCA wouldn't be complete without mentioning the uh, battle over the killing of Vincent Chin. Uh, Vincent Chin was a 27 year old Chinese American who was out on June 19th, 1982, celebrating his bachelor party and his upcoming wedding, uh, when he was beaten by two white uh, auto workers. Uh, and he was beaten on June 19th, and he passed away on June 23rd. And in the course of that evening, he was uh, subject to racial epithets and the statement, because of UMFs, we're out of work. And so that became the start of a major civil rights crusade, justice for Vincent Chin. And for OCA, uh, it started with a phone call. When the uh, sentence was meted out in, in the uh, criminal setting, in criminal court, uh, the perpetrators, Evans and Nitz, only got a $3,000 fine and three years probation. Uh, we had trusted the system and it failed us. And so uh, that became the start of organizing uh, in that case. Kin Yi, who was with the Anliang uh, Chinese Welfare Council, called me, uh, the OCA Detroit chapter president, and that was the beginning of a collaboration that led to the founding of American Citizens for Justice, a collaboration between the Chinese Welfare Council and OCA Detroit. And later on, uh, the movement grew exponentially, starting with just uh, a table in a restaurant. Uh, people gathered, uh, again, 100 people uh, at on Leong Hall in uh, Detroit's Chinatown, and then it grew to 300 or so people at Ford World Headquarters. 
So the movement, you know, started with, uh, you know, a meager beginning, but it was very important uh, in terms of the chapter, OCA Detroit chapter, reaching out to the national to get attention of the federal government, to get the FBI involved in the Department of Justice. And so thanks to Laura Chin, the executive director of OCA at the time, she arranged for a meeting between Lily Chin, the mother of Vincent Chin, Helen Zia, and Assistant Attorney General William Bradford Reynolds, uh, who was then the head of the civil rights uh, section of the Department of Justice. And so it's very important as an example of sort of chapter and national office cooperation to get the attention of people in Washington to push forward for that federal case. Uh, it was important to uh, draw upon media. It was uh, something that hit the local papers first, got the attention of New York Times uh, and Judith Cummings and a, a journalist there, and then it went viral. And so uh, it was very important that uh, media was involved to build interest in the case nationally. And so rallies occurred uh, nationally. So many uh, chapters were involved. There were rallies in Milwaukee, in Pittsburgh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and that was really the beginning of a national movement for justice. And uh, there were two civil rights trials that didn't result in any uh, additional jail time for those individuals, but it was a learning experience which would be repeated years later in South Florida with the uh, killing of Jim James Ming Hai Lu and uh, people going down to the South Florida chapter, uh, the OCA chapter and Winnie Ting and, uh, you know, just kick, picking up the, uh, the baton to try to get justice for Jim Ming Hai Lu. Uh, I think there are key issues to be uh, learned for today in terms of uh, post Atlanta, uh, what is uh, deemed important, uh, getting the media involved, uh, getting coalitions formed, and uh, to get uh, to pay attention to uh, such issues like the change in venue, which occurred in the uh, Detroit case where the second civil rights case was ulti ultimately moved to uh, Cincinnati. Uh, but uh, Bottom line, that case is sort of an important template for coalition building and organizing and engaging the media and something that uh, all, all the chapters of OCA can, can learn from. And uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Debbie. Well, I think I'm coming back. <laughs> oh. It's okay. okay. Um, first. So with the next, so um, I, I think, Roland, I think that's really great to really um, lay the groundwork in terms of what was done because that really was a great template. And we always have to remember that at that time there was no social media, we had no websites. I remember you know, when you had to make a long distance call, you had to pay for every single minute, right? So um, organizing and really getting the media attention was really key because essentially, especially at that time, the only, way you could get national attention was through the traditional media. There was no such thing as social media, right? And so, you know, after Vincent Chin, the fight against hate actually continues on. It's not that things had calmed down. Um, you know, there were continuing to have different incidences of different hate crimes that have happened. Um, back in 1987 in New Jersey, um, a lot of the news covered the dot busters where Navros Modi was being to death by a group of youth who called themselves the Dot Busters, who irregularly targeted and assaulted South Asian Americans. Um, and then, you know, also in 1989, you have Jim Liu in North Carolina. And at that time, you have to realize the Asian American community in North Carolina is, 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 is actually a smaller community there. And he was also, um, died from injuries resulting from a savage beating at the hands of two white brothers 
who essentially expressed their hatred for Orientals, especially Vietnamese. Um, and, and during the late 80s and early 90s, you also saw a number of hate incidences and crimes um, focusing also on the, um, the Vietnamese community. So people are also aligning themselves and thinking through about the Vietnam War. Um, Tustin, California, um, Tin Lai is stabbed 20 times in the face and chest by two white men. Um, and then even during my college years in 1997, I remember for the longest time, um, all of us had to boycott Denny's um, because um, in Syracuse, New York, three APA students um, who are international Asian students and a white companion were being up in the parking lot of a Denny's restaurant after being refused service. Um, and essentially these a group of white patrons after um, being the students up, they went back into Denny's and continued on finishing the meals. And the security guards, um, both were off-duty sheriff deputies, just watched and did nothing, right? And so time and time again, throughout the 80s and 90s, we kept seeing these type of incidences that happen. Um, it, another uh, point um, where it got a lot of national attention was back in 1999 in Los Angeles where Joseph Aletto, a mail carrier, is shot and killed by a white supremacist who just wounded five in a shooting at a Jewish community center. Um, he asked Aletto where he could mail a letter and then shot him in, in cold blood. And the main reason for killing him was that he was a federal employee and that he was not white. Um, and then I remember also in 2000 um, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Three out of five eight, uh, people killed by white men targeted minorities during a shooting spree, and three of them were Asian, and one was paralyzed from the neck down as well. Um, and so during this entire time period, we were very fortunate that OCA um, had a paid staff at that point, executive director Daphne Kwok, and um, later on the OCA continued to expand their staff. So every time there was a hate incident, um, or a, um, uh, a um, hate crime that was actually happening, we would actually go there on site, meet with the community, actually bring um, and sort of be that middle person to be able to work with the federal government um, to really get the initial intake, to get the support that they needed to ensure that as they progressed with the prosecution that they were given the legal help that they needed uh, once again, as a reminder, there was no National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. Um, so a lot of these type of um, things that we take for granted in terms of different resources and expertise, um, we did not necessarily have that at that particular time. It really was working in an allyship with the Anti-Defamation League or the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, where we were able to learn and understand what are the different resources, how to best uh, work with the federal government and, and the prosecution and to really be able to um, figure out and maneuver this as, as we saw this popping up as these hate crimes and hate incidences happen, happen across the country in all these different areas where once again, as a reminder, the population is very small. There was not as large of an infrastructure in some of these states. Um, moving forward is then, you know, 20 years after Vincent Chin, it's like, then we had 9-11. So now we had a number of Sikh Americans, South Asians that were being targeted um, during this time period. Um, OCA at that particular point in time, what we did with, especially with JCL and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, we decided that we need to, needed to center the South Asian community. We essentially, um, a week after 9-11, we were able to persuade um, and make sure that um, Secretary Norman Mineta was able to reach out and talk to President Bush at that time to really have a strong statement about um, making sure that they do not racial profile and that um, um, all this anti-Asian violence really need to stop and racial profiling. Uh, we held here on this, on this um, photo here on the left is a national press conference with a wide variety of civil rights organizations um, calling for the stop of racial profiling and to really try to educate, um, you know, that this type of hate would, was actually destructive. 
Um, along with that, there were a number of rallies and organizing around the country. And then ultimately, um, OCA decided that uh, we really need to make sure that in, in terms of 9-11, in terms of making sure that our narrative was being told, that we created our own book called Voices of Healing, um, where we really centered on Asian American victims, Asian Americans um, who were the frontline um, staff, really in terms of the recovery and also the day of during 9-11, the heroes, um, those that were, were traumatized and what had happened to them afterwards. Um, but you know, it's a wide collection of different stories and pictures that typically are not necessarily seen when you're thinking about 9-11 because a lot of the 9-11 books and coverage did not necessarily cover the Asian American um, collective stories. And so that was really an important piece that we had decided that was needed as we move forward with 9-11. Um, some of the other work I really want to um, highlight is that I'm not necessarily going through in um, chronological order, but more in, in terms of thematics. Um, nowadays, we hear like Asian Americans are always uh, being portrayed either as the model minority, as the other, or the perpetual foreigner. Well, I think the, the basis of this perpetual foreigner, or back then what we call the Americanized foreigner, really stemmed um, during the time period in 1996, when with the uh, President, President Clinton, or actually at that time, the Clinton-Gore um, campaign, um, there was a controversy where there were Asian donors um, that were illegally donating to the campaign. And there were not necessarily the infrastructure to ensure that all the Asians that were being, that were participating in the finance um, were actually legitimate um, donors that were allowed to actually be able to participate in that. But because of that, um, because of a few folks that illegally donated and also organized and bundled um, funds to the campaign, um, it was essentially seen that Asians overall or should be considered like foreigners. And then the DNC had went ahead and considered um, looking back at all their donations from Asian um, donors to double check whether or not there were legitimate um, contributions. That was something that OCA as well as JCL and a number of other civil rights organizations fought against because in reality, it really shouldn't be racial pro profiling a certain segment of their donors. But in reality, what we were um, advocating for is that they have a stronger process in vetting all their donors um, especially at, at a certain level of donations. Um, so it was a long fought battle. And then also during this time period, you also have to realize that the FBI got involved. I do, re I remember as a staff member at OCA, the FBI coming into our office, asking questions about some of the characters um, that were involved with this controversy. Did they go to your convention? And you have to realize once again, the community was so small. So everyone really knew each other and attended each other's conventions and events. And um, so it was a very traumatic time period for a lot of um, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans. Um, I also would say that this controversy back in 1996 really um, you know, uh, held back uh, a lot of Asian Americans in terms of getting involved with politics. I think for several years after that, it was harder to get Asian Americans to donate, to uh, run for office. Um, and the whole idea that if, if you are to run for office or, or be more involved, you're constantly labeled as a foreigner and you always are having to explain yourself that um, why you legitimately um, can run for office or that you've been living here and you're always like, having to justify um, that you're American here. Um, so that's where, that's one thing I wanted to like point out in terms of where this really had bubbled up and, and transpired. The next theme is also about the questioning of loyalty. You know, we're seeing that still these days as we're um, talking about different scientists that are being investigated um, um, and many times um, not necessary with the, with the right um, justifications. Um, the biggest case that we saw this in terms of racial profiling was really with the Wen Ho Lee case, 
Um, at that time, Ose called for due process for Wen Ho Lee, who allegedly was accused of espionage while working for Los Alamos National Laboratories. And because of this one case, it actually impacted Asian employees in all the national laboratories. Um, and there's a number of them across the country where um, we have a large segment of the employees are of Asian descent. Um, so OCA and at that time Daphne Kwok met with Secretary of Energy Bill Richardson to really address these issues. Um, Daphne as well as um, Yvonne Lee, who uh, later on worked for the US Commission on Civil uh, Rights, um, went on a tour to all the different national laboratories to meet with the Asian employees to really find out what kind of treatment that they had, what were the barriers that they were facing, to really come up with a document to be able to present to the secretary to like um, make them understand how, um, how, how they're being perceived is, and stereotype is impacting their work. Um, later on in 2000, um, Secretary Bill Richardson then decided to announce the appointment of two OCA members, Jeremy Wu to be the national ombudsman for the Department of Energy and Daphne Kwok to be a member of the Secretary of Energy's advisory board. So that would allow the um, Asian American employees a uh, opportunity and a venue to be able to um, try to um, deal with their grievances as well as try to figure out how they could change internally at the national laboratories um, and prevent further discrimination um, in terms of moving forward. Other issues that we've continued to work on from day one um, when we were first um, created was immigrant rights and immigration. Um, you know, there's always has, it's always been a long um, battle. Um, ever here we actually have um, where we're participating in the signing of Immigration Act of 1990s. Uh, we've also dealt with immigration issues as it's tied to um, access to welfare um, in the welfare reform um, time period. Um, during the also the 2000s and 90s uh, time period, we also did a lot of education around the form I-9. So many of you, when you have a new job, you are to submit your I-9 form with your legal documents um, showing that you can work here in the United States in, in the United States. Well, at that particular time, there was a lot of racial profiling of Asians um, questioning whether or not you could legitimately work here in the US. And many times you were asked for more documents than you were actually needed. So we launched a, a campaign to really educate the Asian community about what your workers' rights were and what type of documentation you really should be providing. The other work that we've done is that um, is really pushing back on destructive narratives. Um, once again, you have to realize it since we didn't have the internet. Um, really finding out all these different um, uh, incidences and uh, racial issues and, and topics, it really, we really counted on the grassroots, the chapters, the members to be tuning in to what's happening locally and to be able to bring up to the national office so that way a campaign can be launched and that we could go ahead and try to deal with this, not only um, in that local area, but if they were part of a national network to making sure that these corporations of these radio stations um, or, um, or these networks would address it um, across the board, across the country. Um, so it really led to a lot of the organizing. And then we also had to deal with, you know, even like Abercrombie and Fitch and also um, consumer driven type of of companies where they were like creating um, very offensive different uh, attire or games or just different uh, propaganda that they were trying to sell to be able to make money. Also at that time, you know, you also see Shaquille O'Neal uh, racially taunt um, Chinese Houston Rockets um, Yao Ming. So, you know, everyone's always thinking about the Jeremy Lin incident. Well, this also happened um, early on in Yao Ming's um, uh, life. Um, obviously, you know, these two are now really great friends and um, Shaquille O'Neal has learned a lot from that time period. Um, but, you know, I think a lot, a large segment of the work that was being done in the 90s and 2000 really was 
this constant barrage of different incidences that were happening and that we realized that we couldn't just let it slide away, that we actually had to be proactive in addressing this. This included in 1998 with MSNBC having a, um, the, a title of, a, of an article called American Beats, Beats Out Quan. Um, once again, with the, you know, noting that it's, it's, you're inciting that Quan is not necessarily American. Or in the Seattle Times, um, later on have reported saying that American outshines Quan. Once again, they're like assuming that Quan is not an American. Um, also in the same time, you know, we, we saw that Connie Chung even did a, a news report on CBS about a Chinese spy report. Um, and we had to call her out on that and say that the way she had portrayed her story, it really led people to think that all Asians or all Chinese were, were, can be potentially a spy. Um, so these are all issues that we continue to hear today and are constantly still battling. At the same time, uh, what our other side of the work that we do is also recognizing contributions of Asian American Pacific Islanders. Um, nowadays, we take for granted that there's a Lunar New Year stamp. Well, that all started um, back in 1992 um, uh, with Jean Chang, Jean Chen, uh, who was an OCA Georgia member who came up with this idea. And we had to um, do the hard work of organizing and making the case. And we really were the first ones to really to be able to champion and, and win a campaign to get the US Postal Service to recognize the contributions of our community. And since then, I think it's been a lot easier to get a wide variety of diverse um, stamps out of the US Postal Service. But it's also recognizing, um, such as in here in Ohio, a historical marker that Asians were also in the American Civil War on both sides, in the North and in the South, and what that history also looked like. Um, also, along with that, even um, back then, we were also working with PBS and what we now know as the Center for Asian American Media in uh, promoting different Asian American films and documentaries at that particular time and continuing to you know, support any Asian American um, authors that would come out as well. In the next slide, we also would um, show that we were constantly advocating for representation whether that was um, fighting for Bill Lon Lee's appointment as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights back in 1998, or to also um, ensure that Norman Mineta finally becomes the first cabinet secretary at that particular point in time with President Clinton um, in 2000 to be the Secretary of Commerce. And then later on, he was also chosen to serve in the Bush administration as Secretary of transportation. Um, and with that came along, I would always say that OSE was always there when history was being made within um, the Asian American community. Here we see um, President Bush signing the first proclamation for Asian American um, Heritage Month. And um, at that time, it was a week, then prolonged to a month. Um, here we also have um, OCA attending the White House award ceremony, conferring the Medal of Honor to 22 API um, or Chinese American World War II veterans as well. And so, you know, throughout history, um, OCA was there um, not only for that moment, but in reality, we were the ones working behind the scenes to make sure that these things actually happened as well. But also looking forward, as we saw that the community was growing, you know, here in the 90s, especially um, in 2000 with the census 2000, we saw their large growth spurt of the um, API community and how it became to diversify. Um, we also recognized that we needed more infrastructure within the community. We needed more sister organizations that could work with the African American and Latino communities in other areas. So one area was in 2000 with the Gates Millennium Scholarship Program, OSE was um, designated to implement this massive um, scholarship program for AAPI students um, with the goal that we will work with a cohort of other national organizations to ultimately um, create what we know as the API Scholars. Um, 
At the same time, in 1996, after the campaign finance controversy, we also recognize that the media and those outside DC really do not understand where to go to when you're when you want to work with the API community on public policy issues or to understand what the national infrastructure looked like. So in 1996, with the help of um, the brain trust of Secretary Mineta, Daphne Kwok, uh, Karen Urasaki, um, we then created the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, which nowadays is actually stems up to, I believe now it's like 35 or 36 national API um, civil rights organizations that do advocacy work at the federal level as well as the local level. And then um, OCA also great, gave birth to API Vote. At that time, I was a staffer at OCA and Daphne Kwok was the executive director. But a number of us, uh, before the 1996 elections, we also recognized that we as a community was not uh, being as effective in our lobbying and advocacy efforts because our community was not necessarily voting at the same levels as other communities. And we need to start launching a campaign of that. So this actually was a project under OCA for several years. And then in 2007, um, API Vote uh, spun off as a standalone organization. But today, as you look at these three organizations, um, we have to remember that its history is, is, is belongs to OCA. And because of OCA's leadership and infrastructure, they actually helped give birth to these three organizations as well. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and um, pass it over to Debbie's to talk a little bit more about the work these days in the last 10 years. Thank you, Christine. A, a couple of things that Christine did not mention was the number of groundbreaking programs that happened while she and Daphne were there in the office as you know consecutive EDs. Uh, one of which was you know OCA is famous for is our intern program. We run, I will you know, be biased and say, we run the best uh, AAPI internship program, the oldest AAPI internship program, and really kind of set that model that a lot of different organizations now follow. But most, more importantly, is that we created that internship program and we wanted to work with other organizations so that all the different interns who come to DC in the summer, they actually all meet each other, right? And it's about that building that, that pipeline of leadership and making sure that everybody works together. And so I'm not quite sure if we're still doing brown bag lunches pre-pandemic, but I believe that they are doing uh, Sama Sama type of trainings together. Um, um, a couple of other programs were APIU and uh, Y Advocate that were started under Christine and Daphne's leadership. And then um, after Daphne and Christine, uh, OCA actually went through this period where we looked at you know, our, our mission, essentially. We were founded as a civil rights organization. And when we looked at the breadth of the different programs, like we expanded to, you know, include like OCA Reads to promote API authors under uh, Executive Director George Wu. Uh, we started the uh, Build Breakthrough Believe B3 program, which is the professional development program under uh, the ED George Wu. And then later under ED Tom Hayashi, we started uh, MAP, Mentoring Asian Pacific Professionals. Uh, to really try and expand our, our reach, but really to further that building of the pipeline of not just having leadership out there who happen to be Asian, but to have leaders who actually understand the issues that impact our communities. And so that goes back to the fundamental core of, you know, who are we? Um, so the national board evaluated this and looked at, you know, a lot of times we've always been talking about, it's about equal opportunity and equality, when in reality, it's really more about equity. And so we changed our tagline to actually, uh, instead of saying we are a civil rights organization, we grew to become, you know, a social justice organization to really more fully encompass the work that we do. And over those decades, uh, we also looked at, um, and this started, you know, back when Christine was here, this conversation of, you know, 
we started as the organization of Chinese Americans. We then evolved to be, you know, organization of you know Chinese and Asian Americans or Asian Pacific Americans. Uh, and then finally, we just said we're going to stop using organization of Chinese Americans and simply just use OCA. And some of us joke around and say we're an organization of community advocates, OCA, Asian Pacific American advocates is our official name right now. Um, and what does that really mean, right? If you go back to the history and founding of OCA, we cared about and we came together because of hate crimes. We came together for immigration reform. We come together for civic engagement. It's about getting a seat at the table and not being invisible and, you know, essentially having power, right? And so, you know, every 10 years, OCA consistently works on census outreach to make sure that our communities are counted, which flows into our civic engagement work. Uh, various chapters do everything from uh, as basic as voter registration to participating with all deaf, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund for the exit survey that happens every two years. And we've been partnering together since the 90s to uh, actually some chapters, you know, taking on, you know, legal cases with our attorneys, all deaf. Uh, most recently in 2018, where um, the OCA Greater Houston chapter uh, sued the state of Texas for uh, their misinterpretation of the Voting Rights Act and essentially, you know, dis discriminating against those who want to bring someone to assist them versus tr uh, a translator to help people to go vote. And that directly impacts the AAPI community, as well as other communities that are lim limited English proficient. Uh, we expanded our work to include tech policies. Uh, we have a whole tech policy portfolio now, and people ask, well, why tech? And it's fundamentally because it's about equity and access, right? The world has changed where before, before social media, we relied on paper. <laughs> there was a time when we actually sent out physical newsletters, uh, physical magazines, and now so much is online and so much is based off of social media that if a significant portion of our community doesn't have access to technology, access to the internet, then they are effectively unable to uh, participate as equally in society. This goes back to everything from children who are in school to working professionals. And then from a policy perspective, you know, there's been a number of challenges that have, you know, impacted us over the years. Um, most recently, issues such as affirmative action have come up. Uh, affirmative action can be a very emotional topic for people who don't understand it and don't distinguish between what does it mean in an education setting versus in the workplace, right? Uh, so we have spent the last several years making sure that our communities learn about how that actually works in the educational setting. Uh, we have had numerous committees working on the more recent uh, profiling of uh, Chinese and Asian scientists and engineers. And now we're, well, prior to the pandemic, uh, OCA has a national committee that's been looking at AAPI curriculum to address our visibility. And so these things all kind of came to a head where now we're living in this time where AAPIs are essentially being scapegoated. And we see uh, a huge rise in anti-Asian hate. And OCA has, it, or is, taking its Responding to Hate Crimes, a Community Action Guide, and we are updating it. We will be republishing it and distributing both digital copies as well as physical copies. Uh, I encourage everyone here uh, to, if you know someone, to please you know, report it. Please go to um, AAPI. Oh, shoot. And I'm blanking out. Two, if you could help me. Our own website. Yeah, I, I'll drop it in the chat. Thank you. So you can go there to either report. Thank you. AAPIHateCrimes.org. You can go there to either report, but more importantly, to get information on how to address it, whether it is the, uh, the community action guide 
or the situational awareness workshops that OCA has been conducting nationally every month. And it's teaching safe intervention, as well as uh, there is a component on microaggressions and a future module on bullying. So we are making those free and available to the community. Uh, and then I, I highly encourage everyone to be involved with getting AAPI curriculum passed in your local areas. Uh, it's literally a state by state thing. And once, even if it's passed at the state level, then it needs to go and be brought into uh, or adopted as curriculum school district by school district. So there's still quite a bit of work for us to do. And I think that a lot of this is going to really have long-term impact and having us not be invisible and to know the history and appreciation of the history and contributions of AAPIs in this country are going to impact all the other areas of work that we do and those generations coming up after us. So I am invite and encourage everyone to be a part of us. We were founded in 1973. Our founding chapters were in Detroit, St. Louis and Washington DC continues to be our headquarters. And our 50th anniversary is coming up in 2023. Uh, I will give a plug. Our convention this year is virtual. Uh, it is free and open to anyone who wants to attend our convention. Next year we'll be in Las Vegas, August 4th through the 7th weekend. And then 2023, we will be in Washington, D.C., and I hope all of you consider joining us to celebrate. Awesome. Thank you for sharing um, our story, Christine, Debbie, and Roland. Um, for anyone who is in the audience, if you have questions, you can drop it in the chat or drop it in um, the Q&A. But the first question we have is from Ariani. Hi, Ariani. Um, for Roland. So earlier this week, she had a question. So she wants to pass it on to you is, um, why was it that the Vincent Chin case and not another case, for example, like Peter Yu or Cho Su Lee endured as a symbol for the movement? Do you have any thoughts on that, Roland? Well, I think that uh, at the time of the Vincent Chin case, uh, what propelled the case was actually the energy of individuals. Uh, it was Helen Zia, a journalist at the time with the Free Press, uh, not a lawyer, who said, we've got to do something. And a lot of the lawyers around the table, including myself and Jim Schmore and a few others, were, were talking about double jeopardy or other considerations. But there was a force to be reckoned with in Helen Zia and Lily Chin, the mother of Vincent Chin. She was there to say, I want justice for my son. Uh, it only takes an individual to just sort of uh, light that spark, much like uh, Mrs. Aletto, you know, the grieving mother picking up the uh, baton for the killing of Joseph Aletto, the, the uh, postal carrier in Chatsworth, California. And it's just been repeated. Uh, we need people to take the lead and people will gravitate to the movement. And a lot of times you really have to, because it's all about respecting the families, respecting the victims. Um, and so you really are going to take the lead of the family members. And so when they are willing to lean in and, and um, do that, and that's what you saw in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? A, a number of the victims' families are like are do not want this to be you know swept aside, but they're leaning in, and so I think you know in some of these cases now with the Asian American community, we're seeing that like uh, for for example the victim of the, the grandmother that decided to take all her donations and donate it back, right? And so um, they're they're really changing uh, the dynamics in terms of what for someone that's actually a victim, they're, they're, they're taking their power um, once again. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for your perspectives on that. I think that's, that's very insightful. 
um, you know, for future generations too, in terms of organizing. So actually in terms of, you know, growth and the future, the question from Ray is, it seems like OCA, you know, is still maturing um, over the past 50 years, similar to CACA. There are also, you know, um, a maturing organization. So what is being done with outreach and coalition building, like with ACLU, NAACP, ADL, um, so like, for example, um, you know, Vincent Chin had spawned like Chinese outrage and George Floyd's death, you know, um, kind of reignited the Black Lives Matter movement. So how can um, the Stop API hate movement ally with BLM? Um, yeah, I would leave that to you all to answer. Well, I can volunteer that uh, there are a lot of groups that are part of the Asians for Black Lives movement. And that's organized city by city. And there really is a rekindling of the coalition building that occurred during the Vincent Chin case in Detroit. Uh, you know, at the grassroots level, we're, we're partnering with the NAACP Detroit chapter and Black uh, Family Development, Hispanic Development Corporation on anti-racism and anti-Blackness and anti-Asian hate. So the coalition is still there. Uh, it's more visible now, uh, but it was always there, you know, over the decades. Yeah, I, I want to reiterate that um, all those coalitions and all those organizations that were named, OCA has been working with them for decades from, the, from day one. And like I said, many times they were the ones that were teaching us in terms of, uh, and, and there are also the ones that were making sure that we were being invited into those meetings. So for instance, uh, back in the 90s, when I was a young staffer at OCA, and, and although they were, um, in my introduction, it was talked about that I was a executive director, um, but I actually was an intern, then a staff member, then executive director. So I was actually with OCA for a decade. And um, during that time period, I remember going to meetings with Hillary Shelton over at NAACP, who's still to this day is the main lobbyist for the NAACP. And many times when he was invited to meetings um, at the White House or on Capitol Hill, and he noticed that there was no Asian being representative being invited, he would say, you need to invite OCA or JCL, and make sure that they're also part of that conversation. So we really have um, been in lockstep with a lot of the civil rights organizations. Um, it's, and it, it, it really depends on the different time periods in our history where the grassroots community continues to um, build those, um, those coalitions. And I think also this day, because of the pandemic, you know, Black Lives Matter movement, it, it didn't just suddenly emerge in 2020, right? I mean, this has been happening, but I think um, for the Asian American community, because different generations have been living together with their, um, with their grandparents, with their parents, there's more opportunities for discussions, sharing of stories of how everyone's feeling um, at this moment in time with all the rise of anti-Asian violence. And how's that connected to white supremacy and, and also to the Black Lives Matter movement and to really um, make those connections. So I feel like coming out of this um, as communities of allies, we're only gonna be stronger coming out of it. I think it really is, it comes down to the local level, right? Every city has their own structure and different coalitions. Like in Houston, you know, we're part of the Houston Coalition Against Hate, we're a, a part of the Houston in Action Coalition and of groups that you know, come together against hate, but also groups that work in civic engagement, right? Because ultimately to make change, we need to have power and it's working together that kind of solidarity of making sure that all of us have equal access and, and rights to be able to exercise our right to vote. Um, ultimately that is going to make a, a huge difference. You know, a few days ago, a, a report just came out on NPR where it, it, it documents that the AAPI community vote came out and made a real significant difference, you know, in solidarity with other communities to impact this last election cycle. So I think that Christine and Roland are exactly on point that 
know, this is a moment in time where we are seeing that rekindling and continuation, but just more publicly of these types of relationships that have existed for decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, actually this is a really good question from the audience to wrap up on is um, from Zoe. What would you say to those who are nervous about getting involved in these kinds of movements or like advocacy work because they are afraid of retaliation or violence? Um, I'm going to throw in there that let's say they've never um, they've never been part of this movement, these movements or this kind of work, you know, what would you say to those people? Can I, uh, can I volunteer problem. something? Uh, people are stronger together. I use the analogy of uh, my parents had the fable about the chopstick. They hand you a chopstick and you can break it pretty easily, but then they hand you a dozen chopsticks and you try to break it and it's impossible. So people have to work collectively and, uh, you know, there is strength in numbers. So I, I think that graphic of having chopsticks, one or a dozen, uh, is really powerful. Go ahead, Debbie. <laughs> I would just encourage you to, you know, first, uh, you know, if it's, if it's about confrontation, please take a you know, intervention training course first. Any type of, of intervention, we want you to, to do it in a safe manner. Um, but in terms of getting involved, uh, I would say that you know, there are many different types of people out there. And sometimes you just have to find that right person where you click with, right? Um, everyone has different working styles. And so, you know, you may be lucky and go out and you meet the right group and, and they welcome you with open arms. And the reality is that you may also meet people who are not as welcoming. My advice to you would be to encourage you to stay the course, right? To see the bigger picture and realize that that's just one minor bump in the bigger picture. The bigger picture, we need to all work together. We need to, to be in solidarity. We need to be collective in order to get the broader picture done. So don't let the individual moments, you know, put you off from staying the course. And I will also say that everyone has a role um, in a wide variety of ways. I think what's special about this, mo this moment is that for the last 30 years since I've been in, here, almost in, here in DC doing this work, this is the first time where I've seen so many different sectors, different um, parts of the community, different economic status, uh, different generations are leaning in. They're also, for those that have been thinking that, you know, I'm, I don't necessarily need to lean in, into my identity as much in, in my work, they actually realize that they need to and that they need to share their stories. Um, you know, the biggest question everyone keeps saying is that, before Atlanta, they're like, we did not realize this was happening. I had no idea. Part of it is, yes, we we blame the media and, and our elected officials for not addressing it properly. But at the same time, uh, we as a community also need to feel comfortable about processing what we're going through and sharing how we're feeling and, um, and the struggles as well as our celebrations um, that we're having. And I'm not saying, you have to do a press release or anything. I'm just saying, share with your colleagues, share with whoever you feel comfortable with, um, because that is going to also help in terms of educating the, the multi layers of our community. And that's also a way for us to make sure that we dispel all the stereotypes that are being pushed upon us and to change that narrative. I totally agree. Um, so th that wraps up our first session for today, which goes over the legacy and history of OCA. You can actually tune in tomorrow, same time, different place. You should have a different RSVP Zoom link um, and join our team over at OCA National Center, where we go over 
currently what our programs are for you to get involved, for you to follow. A lot of it is free um, and you can hear more on what actually we're doing on you know, anti-Asian hates, immigration, technology, um, and all of our programming from youth to work, young working professionals for our members um, and why you should be an OCA member potentially. And so again, thank you all joining us tonight as we learn about OCA history. I learned a lot myself um, and I'd like to hand it back over to Kin. Thank you, Chief. On behalf of the uh, CAHF, thank you to Christine, Roland, and Debbie for such an informative session. Uh, thank you attendees for joining us. And as two said, come back tomorrow for a uh, session on a discussion on OCA's future. So again, thank you everyone. And we'll see you tomorrow night. Bye-bye everybody.